the presentation of Campaigns for Cancer with Bob Lee on the controls with Hall of Famer Ralph Sem. How you the doing? world record holder, Ralph, good to see you again. The world record holder, high single, the first one to get to the fountain of 245 in 1984. Right. And Chris Sargent did in 2011 to tie it right. at Metro and PBD Mass. Right. And we got a lot to talk about today in this next five minutes or so. Okay. Tell us the story behind the 245. What happened that day? Well, that was a nice Sunday afternoon. I was here working and I got a phone call and said, Ralph, you're supposed to be at the community lanes in Westfield on the pro tour. I said, whoops. So off I went. Got the car, drove all the way down there, went in the bowling center, forgot my bowling balls back at the lanes, and forgot my bowling shoes. So I rented a pair of rental shoes, used house balls. Community lanes was one of the old-fashioned lanes where the gutters were deep all the way to the end. There was no flat gutters, no slanted gutters, nothing like today. Uh, and I, I used house balls, and, you know, it's, it's a game that's a tough game, a lot of luck involved, no question about it. So I get up, first ball I throw, strike. Second ball I throw, strike. Charlie Dutras is bowling next to me. Steve Legenz is on the other side. And they're watching third ball, strike. Fourth ball, strike. Fifth ball, strike. You know, it's, it's a game that is so hard to understand because whether you hit the 1-2 pocket or the 1-3 pocket or the 4-7 pocket or the 6-10 pocket, if they're falling, you're going to get them. When I got up in the seventh frame after we sat down after five frames, threw another strike. Seventh frame, another strike. I'm going, holy mackerel, Charlie's scratching his head. And you know, to that, to the day, oh, probably a year and a half, two years later, Charlie kept coming up to the bowling center and saying, I don't know how you did it. Well, I don't either. You know, it was the bowling balls were a different weight that same day too, Now, Well, the house balls, you, you never know what a house ball is because there's chips and cracks and this and the other thing. So yes. The balls were all different weights, and they were all hard pins. And like I said, the plates at Westfield Community Center was an old-fashioned bowling center. Gutters were deep. Nothing would roll out of the gutters, so you had to really hit the pins to get them. After that, I got three spares in a row, but, you know, try to get a strike on Monday when Channel 40 wanted to watch it. I couldn't do that either, so. Did you give any your house, did you give any your home bowling balls and your home shoes? I still have them all. I still have them all, now, yeah. The question I have to ask you is, yeah. if you didn't forget those, do you think we would have done the same thing? No. <laughs> no, not a chance. Funny game, isn't no. it? Yeah, it is a funny game. It, it, it is what it is. Candle pin is a New England sport, something that we all have grown up with. I came into this game in 1959. I was a ski jumper on a U.S. ski jumping team on the Olympic team. My father says, what are you doing on a Saturday night? Well, we went bowling. We were down at West Point. It was 10 pin. The next week we were in Salisbury, Connecticut. It was duck pin. Then we're up at Greenfield Mass ski jumping. It's candle pin. I'm going, holy mackerel. Next thing I know, Dad says, I just bought 12 bowling machines from Bowmore. It was the first time Bowmore ever sold outright because they would always lease the machines. Dick Cowan and company and Dick Eaton and, and, and Cowan, I forgot his first name now, they came up here. We opened this place on September 4th, 1959. I remember the Miller's Falls Paper Company League bowling up here. They came in to wait for the approaches to finish drying before they could bowl. Today, we were, what, 40 years later or something like that, close to it, 50 years, 60 years, 60 years later. Time flies when you're having fun, I can tell you that. You know, the game is such an interesting game. Whether you, I, I struggled one night to get a 70, and every, every the whole league stopped watching. <laughs> they stopped watching. Look at Ralph, he's only going to have a 70. So you never know, you know, you could punch and punch and punch. To take a guy like Sim Susi today, who came in here at the bottom and had to bowl all those strings and come out on top, takes a lot of effort and a lot of strength, you know. But every one of us who bowls can, whether you're a female, a male, whether you're a child, it's a game that is so much fun. You can scream, you can holler, you can enjoy yourself. Unlike 10-pin, you know, where 10-pin, because I had 10-pin in the house once here already. And uh, you couldn't mix the two people together. So you're the only bowler to start a matchup with seven strikes in a row. Yes, I am. And I have the only one that's ever had 150 perfect half. You still have the score sheet? Oh, yeah. It's right there on the wall. Yeah, we'll get a picture later on the up and chat. Yeah, sure. So you're on the Hall of Fame committee also. Yes, I've been chairing the Hall of Fame committee since Chris Anton decided it was time for him to give it up. And I thought I was going to retire and get off of that because they were talking about different things. But it's hard today to get people into the Hall of Fame only because you don't have all the TV shows any longer. 
But it's a show like this, King of the Hill, that's going to bring some of these people into our minds to look at for the future Hall of Famers. That's what it's going to take. And uh, I firmly believe that. So we're going to be hopefully having a Hall of Fame banquet this October. And they told me that, no, Ralph, you're still the chairman. <laughs> and so we're going to start meeting pretty soon to get it done. I hope we can stream that Hall of Fame ceremony, if possible, this year, too. Yeah, I think that that would be great if you could do that. Sure. Channel Family Network. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. So, people ask, the, so people ask the question, where is the Hall of Fame located? Well, uh, it used to be uh, in Boston, and then uh, now we're trying to get into Worcester and all the backbone of Channel Pin by itself. And we were trying to get it into the, the, what is the Worcester Sox, whatever it is, into that area. Bob Perel has been doing a lot of work on trying to get it situated again so we can bring all that paraphernalia back out. I know that there is a, in, 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 in Arlington, Texas, at the, at the Ten Pin Hall of Fame, we have a little spot in there, but it doesn't doesn't really show a lot about cannel pins. It's a, it's a totally new, new England sport, and it's something that we are all proud of, those of us who have been a proprietor for so many years. And we've had a lot of great proprietors and a lot of great bowlers, you know. Talk with Ralph Sem, Canapin Legend Hall of Fame, the world record holder 245 with Chris Sargent. We did it in 2011. Ralph did it in 1984. So, how the highlights of your career, your illustrious career? Oh, well, I, uh, I've been a, on the Olympic team ski jumping, 1964, Innsbruck, Austria. The love of my life is Shriners Hospital for Children. I ran the uh, 22 hospitals for eight years as a CEO. I was on the Shriners paternal side of it as the imperial potentate 1999-2000 brought over 12,000 rooms to Boston and had the last two parades that were the biggest parades that Boston has ever seen in years and uh, you know I, I've just enjoyed so many things around here whether it's in the fraternity of the Shriners or the Masonic fraternity or Scottish or York Rite any of those fraternities are all charitable organizations just like Candlepin for Cash is we're all wonderful organizations and things that people should really take note of before the match, you made an announcement to the crowd before we went on live streaming earlier with Bob Lee doing a great job, the executive producer for Kenneth Moly Network. You mentioned that you're never going to get rid of this place. The reason I say that is because I put all the nails in the floors. I built it, and I worked with Dick Eaton and, and Cowan and those people, and I saw them as they built the lanes up. I saw them as they pushed them over. I saw where all the dust went. And I've been in here since 1959. And the reason I came in here, I was going to college. And the first day we were open, my father was not mechanically inclined. And he went to grab a V-belt, cut his thumb off, and he says, Ralph, you're working from now on. <laughs> and there I've been, you know. So I've had, you know, I've had the motels, I've had the apartments, I've had a restaurant, I've had the bowling center, I've got a post office. So I've been on this property since 1945. Where do you see the future of Canelpin going, bowling going? Is there any hope for getting outside more spots in New England? Yes, there is. The problem that we have is the manufacturing of a machine. We don't have anybody to do that. There is a lot of, as I'm going through the, uh, the uh, Bowler Proprietor Association of America, I used to go to those conventions all the time. We would bring the Canelpins there, the balls and everything else. People were very interested in it. But where do we get the machines? Canopin specialists, they'll make a few, but nobody's making them in mass. And if we can get somebody to make them, I believe a lot of people in Florida, the seniors, would love to bowl Canopins down there. Absolutely. Texas. That's a California. sport for all ages, yeah. That's right. And I think that we, it would happen. But we got to have a manufacturer. We've got to have people make the product. So what is the, what is the committee thinking about how to, how to do that? Is there a plan in place to try to do that somehow? We have tried to work with Canopin specialists and other people. And nobody's come up with a plan or a machine to do it. I mean, we're still working at it. I know the Scott Perella, who's the president now of the International Candle for Bowling Association, which I was president for 24 years. You know, we've tried and tried and tried to work with people, but it's just hard because they don't think it can sell. We believe. We, we went out to California one time and put in six lanes. The problem was nobody knew what to do with the bowling balls, and nobody was out there to teach them how to do it. And I went out there, and, they, I, and I tried to show them. They said, oh, that's totally different. We would throw one ball, let somebody else throw another ball. Canopin is a game that is not quiet. It's fun, and people have to learn that. Now, listen, I got one thing over you, though. You got the world record of 245. You're in the Hall of Fame. There's one thing I got over you that you don't have on me. That's right. I got the last strike on Canopin for cash with Bob Gamera in 1980. <laughs> 
Congratulations. My only, claim, my only claim to fame. It's a great claim to fame, let me tell you. Thank well, you Sam, much. pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, Sam at French King Bowling Center, Irving, Massachusetts, with Bob Lee and Paul Grant from Kenneth Bowling Network, special interview with Ralph Sam. Thank you for watching Kenneth Bowling on